If it is your first time here, welcome home. I'm so excited that you spend uh, spending your Wednesday night with us tonight. This is a place where you can encounter the love of God with people that love God and love each other. And this year, we've been really leaning into this specific word. We feel like God has given us a word for this year, and that's so not me. Like, I'm not that preacher guy that always has a word for the year. But this year, we really felt like God said that over our group, this is a year of progress. Everybody say progress. Come on, like you're as Pentecostal as I am, say progress. Progress. We're going to make some progress in 2021. And in January, we've been doing this Vision Month sermon series. So if you are new here, you picked a great time to be here. This is a, a, a great month to be involved. Now, that's it for all the stuff at the front end. I'm excited to preach. If you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to be in the book of Genesis. All the way back to the very first book of the Bible. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 13. I'm going to read for a couple verses. Um, I'm going to give you my sermon title for tonight. We're going to pray together and then we're just going to see where we end up. Last week, I kid you not, last week I started the sermon by saying, oh, it's been a couple weeks since I've preached and I'm so excited and I'm going to be honest, I've got a lot bottled up and I could preach for three hours, but I'm totally not going to do that. Don't worry about it. Then I went back and watched the, the video that we take because we, we throw everything up on YouTube and then I went back and checked the podcast and your boy preached almost 45 minutes last week. That is probably the longest sermon I have ever preached. I don't apologize, but I don't intend to preach that long tonight. So, We'll see. It's a hair past a freckle, and we'll just see how long we go. But for real, I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to keep you here all night unless the Lord wills it. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. We'll be out of here in 25, 30 minutes. Anyway, with all that being said, Genesis chapter 13, starting in verse 14. God is speaking to Abram, and he says, Look around from where you are, to the north and south, to the east and west, and all the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Now go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. Sermon title for tonight is Take the Land. Turn to your neighbor and say, Take the Land. Like you actually mean it, like it's not after nine o'clock, like you had a cup of coffee and you're excited to be at church, say, take the land. All right, (laughs) let's pray together. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the honor that it is just to be involved, just to be in the room with such incredible people. God, some of us are here excited for the new year. Some of us are here terrified for the new year. God, but we're all here together as a family. So tonight I ask that as a family, you would help us grow, that we would be transformed by the gospel again tonight, made new again, continuously growing and learning, that when we leave here, we would know you better and have five extra friends. Say amen if you believe it. Amen. So it is hard to believe, but Livy and I have been married seven and a half months. And we were talking about it earlier today, actually, and these last seven months have gone so fast. But I was reminiscing this last week to the craziness of trying to have or trying to have a wedding dear in COVID and all the things that were going on around that. Now, by the grace of God, we still got to do our wedding at the venue that we wanted. We got to invite all the people that we wanted and everything was still just the most beautiful day ever. Now, to my married people in the room, the following story, you're all going to go, yes, I totally remember that. And you're probably going to get anxious in the moment. To my unmarried people in the room, this is what you have to look forward to. Getting married is, in fact, literally the greatest thing that has ever happened to the world. And uh, if anybody tries to tell you different, they're just doing it wrong. Marriage is incredible. It is God's plan for humanity, and it is a wonderful, beautiful thing. So don't settle. Anybody else? Amen. Don't settle. Wait on God's timing and that's another sermon for another day. But it is the most incredible thing ever. Now, we are a week or so before the wedding, and it's getting real. Again, to the married people in the room, you're going, oh, yeah, yeah. mm -hmm." And every day that it gets closer and closer to the wedding, it's getting more real, which means there are two completely different emotions happening at even greater lengths every day. Every day you're more excited and you're like, man, yes, God's plan for my life. This is incredible. She's wonderful. I can't believe I'm about to be her husband. This is the greatest thing ever. Like all those thoughts. Meanwhile, you're also going, oh my gosh, I'm a child. 
How is this going to happen? As a man, I'm going, I can't hardly do my own laundry. How am I supposed to be responsible for another human being? Like all of these things are going through your head. You're so excited and so freaked out all at the same time. So then the wedding day gets here. And again, by the grace of God, we got to have this incredible wedding that is exactly what we wanted. And we were crazy enough after the wedding to go and take more pictures afterwards just to enjoy every moment. And while I do not at all regret taking those pictures, I can tell you that by the time we get back to the house, we were worthless. We're sitting in the living room, opening the cards that people had given us and just crying. I couldn't tell you if it was because they were just sweet cards or if we were just completely delusional from how crazy the week had been. We got up the next morning and we were, we had to change our honeymoon plans quite a bit, but we got to go to Tybee Island in Georgia. Any of y'all ever heard of Tybee Island? It's 30 minutes outside Savannah. If you were to go to Hilton Head and just swim south, you'd end up at Tybee Island. And it is the sweetest, most quaint little beach that you could possibly go to. It feels like if the, whatever, anybody watch Gilmore Girls, whatever the town that that takes place in, if that was on the beach, that's what Tybee Island feels like. So the story here is where things get crazy. We get up, we slept in because it was we were so tired. We get up the day after the wedding, we take our time, we get some coffee, all the things. We get in the car to drive to Tybee Island. By the time we get there, the sun has pretty much gone down the rest of the way. Now, again, your boy that was afraid he couldn't do his own laundry is now in charge of another human being, and we have decided that it's a great idea to just naturally, with our lives in my hand, we're going to get in the car and leave the state away from all our loved ones. It's a very interesting, exciting, wonderful thing, and terrifying all at the same time. By the time we get to this cottage that we've rented at the beach, the sun's gone. It's windy as all get out. And I remember driving back and forth down this block. Now, for Livy, she probably wasn't as stressed as I was. I was stressed out of my mind. The house that we were staying in was like connected to another house. And the driveway was shared. And you could not see the cottage we were staying in from the road. So I'm going to a place I've never been to before. And at this point, the sun's already gone and there is a storm a brewing, as a Southern folk would say. And we have to figure out how to get here. So finally, we find the cottage. My heart rate's coming down a little bit. We get everything unloaded in the house. And I don't know if you're like me, but anytime I go to the beach, I can't just go to the cottage. Like I have to see the ocean before the day's over, right? Is anybody else like that? Okay, there's a storm a brewing. <laughs> at a place I've not been to since I was super, super young. I'm responsible for this whole other human being, and it's dark outside. And you know what we do? We walk right out the front door, and we just start trekking. And I'm processing through, like, where the ocean was on the GPS when we pulled in. So if we go up and we make a left, and then another left, and we just walk, eventually we'll be at the ocean. And you know what? That's exactly what we did. And we're seeing the restaurant that's open on the corner and we pass this kind of boardwalk vibe and we go up behind this hotel and then the moment, right? The moment that everybody just adores when you first get to the beach. We finally get our feet in the sand. And you can, you can smell the salt water is so strong and because there was a storm coming, it's like you can feel it. Like it's, just, it's the most beautiful, incredible feeling. Now for us, we had started this new journey as husband and wife, and we decided we're going to get out of town. We're going to go on this journey together. We're going to make this memory together. God had put us together, called us together, and then we start this new adventure. Tonight, we're looking at Abram's story where everything starts from him. Often you hear me talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and where some of this originated. Now, before God changes Abram's name to Abraham, he gives him this promise that he will have as many children as the stars in the sky. As we read in this opening verse, that if you could count the grains of the earth, you could count his children. God gives him this promise. He gives him this word. And then Abram packs up his family and everything that he has, and he starts on this journey. In Genesis chapter 12, I want to read this to you. This is where God first calls him out. Verse 1 of chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram leaves everything. He leaves his family. He leaves his home. He takes his wife, and the Bible says that he takes his nephew, Lot, and they go on this trip. They just start this trek, much like we did, except he's not really going to the beach on a honeymoon, so it's a little different. But he starts this trek with his family to see what in the world is going to unfold for this promise that God has given him. The Bible says later on in that chapter that on this journey, Abram, his family, his nephew Lot, they settle for the time being in this town between Bethel and Ai. Everybody say Bethel. Bethel. Like you mean it. Say Bethel. Bethel. Say Ai. Ai. I couldn't tell you if that's how it's pronounced, but it's literally those two letters, Ai, right? Now, here's what's crazy about this. If you look at the translations, Bethel means house of God, where Ai means ruins. Abram has picked up his family. He's taken everything that he has to go after God. And on the way, he settles in this land somewhere in between the house of God and the ruins. We've talked about it a lot over the last few months. I know that the last year was wild, and for some of us, it's just like, get me through this, right? More than a journey, more than an adventure, it's just, I'm hanging on for dear life. Hear me, do not settle in the in-between. There is more in store, and this is a year of progress. Everybody say progress. Like you mean it, like you want it, everybody say progress. Mm, Something beautiful is happening. Something beautiful is happening. In Genesis chapter 13, this weird in-between place that they've camped in, (laughs) some drama starts to unfold. The Bible says that the men that work for Abram and the men that work for his nephew Lot begin to bicker and fight, largely because they're growing, their livestock is growing, their crops are growing, and there isn't enough space. So Abram, to keep the peace in his family, he comes to him and says, look, this is silly for us to bicker and fight over all of this. Let's just go our different ways. I'll tell you what, I'll let you choose where you want to go. So Lot, if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And if you go to the left, I'll go to the right. Well, Lot looks around at all of this land, and there's an area uh, south from where they were, down by the Jordan, that was just gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. The water flows well. It's going to be great for their, co- their crops and their livestock. So there they go. He takes off. Abram goes up farther towards Canaan. But when Lot gets down into this city, he realizes that he's right next to Sodom. If you've gone through and studied any of the Old Testament texts or even heard the phrase Sodom and Gomorrah, it's famous for being just a really bad place. Sin was rampant everywhere. Before he knows it, Lot gets stuck in a tricky situation. But Abram, separate from his nephew, goes up to this land, and then God speaks to him. And this is our opening passage of Scripture from tonight. He gets up towards Canaan, and God says, Look around from where you are, to the north and south, to the east and west. It is a total Lion King moment. He takes him up high Look everywhere the sun touches, right? It's this beautiful moment where he declares, not only are you going to have children and children and children and children and your people be my people, but all of this land, all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Now go walk through the length and breadth of the land for I I'm giving it to you. Everybody say, take the land. Say, take the land. I believe with everything in me that God has given us the city of Knoxville. And I know that pastors say that, and that's totally a thing and whatever. But genuinely, in my heart, I believe that God has started something and is stirring something in our city that we get the honor of being involved in. Now, if you, have, if you were here about a year ago, you remember that Pastor Jeremy and Miss Heather went to this conference. And in the middle of the conference, the senior pastor of this church called them down to the altar. And there was this massive prophetic moment where God spoke over them as a couple and over us as a church. And one of the things that was prophesied at the beginning of 2020 was that God was looking for a place to put his presence. And that if Park West would just open up 
and continue to be that place, then we would see not just the glory of God abide here, but salvations and things would change, right? Well, what God prophesied at the beginning of 2020 did not change when March hit and everything got kind of crazy. There are things that have been taking place over the last 12 months that have prepared us for the crazy progress that's going to be made in 2021. God has called us to take the land. So go walk it. God tells Abram, you see over here and over here and over there and over there, go walk through it. All of that is going to be yours. And Psalm 27 says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I believe we will see that in our city, in our churches, in our colleges, in the midst of all the things. I can't tell you at the risk of seeming insensitive, I can't tell you how uninterested I am in all the news and the fluff and the things going on around me. Because what's happening is the whole world, especially our world here in our nation, is becoming more and more aware that Jesus is the only one that's going to save you. There is such an opportunity, such a stage set for revival, for legitimate salvation, radical growth to take place. But it will not happen if we're not willing to make progress if we're not willing to step out to take the land. Let me ask you something. If I mention New York City, what's the first couple things that come to mind? For me, I think about uh, Hillsong, New York. I think about the Yankees. I think about Broadway, right? These are the first couple things that go through my head. If I mention Florida, some of you go straight to the beach. Some of you are at Disney World. And boy, I'd love to go back to Disney World sometime soon. If I mention Washington, D.C., Everybody gets a little anxious. <laughs> well, if I mention Tennessee, specifically, if I mention Tennessee, some of us think of this is my home. Some of you are, are here for school. Some of you think about that wonderful orange color and the Tennessee Vols. <laughs> oh, God help him. God help him. I have this thing that is in my heart that's been here for two years that I just can't shake. That the presence of God would be so intense in our city that when Knoxville, Tennessee is mentioned, it's Jesus that triggers in people's minds. Even if they don't like it, <laughs> especially if they don't like it, right? You better know if you're going to go to Knoxville you got to deal with the weirdos, right? you got to deal with the weird Jesus people. There's churches on every corner. It's ridiculous all over the place. And don't even start with the colleges, even the community colleges. If you're going to go to Roan State, Pellissippi, King College, Johnson University, UT, all the different places, you just better be aware that they're all crazy about Jesus. They love each other. Everybody loves everybody. It's ridiculous. There's sacrifices being made because people just want to see their loved ones taken care of. There's not so much pride. There's not so much hate. We're not arguing and bickering over stupid things. If you're going to go to Knoxville, you better just be okay with knowing that Jesus is there, that the presence of God is there. But that looks like taking steps. It looks like making progress. Well, Abram hears the voice of the Lord. He takes his family on this journey. They end up in this weird in-between, and then the craziness goes down, and they go their separate ways because of family drama. <laughs> Side note, who would imagine family drama would go down, right? I mean, <laughs> no. It's crazy. You can watch families just completely get torn apart over stupid stuff, over stupid stuff. You see the, <laughs> you see anxiety spark. You see depression hit. You see life changes and decisions be made. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes people don't know how to handle it. Let's go even more direct. The church family can get torn apart so quickly. There can be such an easy divide. And in, in the church kind of pastoral world, we joke sometimes about how people leave church because you change the color of the carpet. <laughs> But it can be so silly. We can get so torn up over little things. Well, in case you haven't looked around recently, it's happening a lot right now. 
And to some degree, for some legitimate reasons, for some real concerns, there are some heavy political things that have gone down, some brokenness, some issues, some things that some people really don't want to talk about, some things that need to be discussed, and some things that are just petty and being twisted to push a political agenda. But the church world, the family is being divided. And please hear me. We cannot make the progress that we need to make if our family is so dysfunctional. Now, don't mishear me. If you know me well at all, you know that I'm anything but passive. I'm totally okay with us duking it out to get the best possible outcome. I'm not trying to just push things under a rug and not talk about the real stuff that's going on. We need to have legitimate conversations about racism and abortion and all the things that are going on. This is not about keeping the peace for me. It's about reaching the goal. And for Jesus, the lost has always been and will always be the main goal. And it has got to be our main goal. We will stand for what's right. We will stand on this word And we will not waver. And I'm not telling you that you shouldn't stand for what you believe in. But I am saying that the church has to be able to see those things and duke it out if you have to, to keep the family together. Well, after Abram and Lot go their separate ways, Abram gets an opportunity to practice this. In the cha- end of chapter 13, into chapter 14, they've gone their separate ways. <laughs> Lot finds out real quick that he has, in fact, encamped next to a very, very awful place. Sodom is in a war at this point, and a group comes through, and there's a whole fight that goes down, and they kidnap a bunch of people, including Abram's nephew, Lot. The Bible says that Abram took 318 of his best warriors... And in chapter 14, verse 15, it says, During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. See, how you respond to opposition makes a difference. He has a choice to make. The much easier option is to remember that God had just spoken over him that he was going to multiply his family. He was going to continue to bless him and give him this land. Lot and his boys already weren't getting along. There's drama in the camp and they had to go their separate ways in the first place. So he can either leave him or he can go get him. And I want you to hear me clearly. Part of us making progress this year is recognizing that we are the body of Christ and not every part of the body is going to see things through the same perspective. And that is on purpose. It's so that together we make a full unit that can get things done for the kingdom. So stand for what you believe. Fight for it. (laughs) Do what God has called you to do, but not at the expense of kingdom work being done in regards to the family of God. Amen? Woo! Amen? We're going forward, but we're going forward together. Not only can progress not be made if we're fighting each other, but you can't make progress if you're standing still. New Year's Eve, I made this statement that Some of us need to stop making plans and start making moves. (laughs) And just saying it, it it sounds even kind of silly. You're like, Pastor Caleb, that's ridiculous. That's reckless. I have to have a five-year plan. I I have to know what I'm doing. God wants me to take care of my life and to make wise decisions 100%. But some of you have been thinking about sending that college application in for 10 years. You're not gonna get anywhere if you won't take the first step. He's not looking for you to have plan B and plan C and all the many steps figured out. He's just looking for you to start making progress, to start making steps. Now, here's what's interesting to me about the promise that he's given Abram. He tells him you're going to have as many kids as the stars in the sky. I'm going to give you all of this land. But do you think that ever would have come true if he never would have left his father's land in the first place? The promise that God had given him was a promise that was not going to be broken, but it was a promise that had to have some obedience on Abram's part for it to come into fruition. 
for it to actually happen. Now, God has given us a promise. I believe he has given us this land. But in order for us to take the quote unquote land, we've got to start making progress. We've got to start taking steps. The Great Commission was given on purpose. It's both a promise that God's Spirit is going to come through and fulfill that to burden, to convict people's hearts. But that involves us being obedient to say, what's up? (laughs) To share the love of Jesus Christ. But not just in the way we love people, but to literally proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have all the answers. Just take a step. Talk to the stranger around you. Send a text message to the old friend. Invite somebody to church and share the gospel with somebody you don't know. Let me be even more practical in your individual life. Go ahead and send that college application in. Go ahead and apply for the job. Ask the girl out, for goodness sake. Even if she says, no, it ain't going to hurt anything. You got to take a step. You have to make some progress. Hockey Hall of Famer Wayne Gretzky is famous for making this statement. You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. It is okay to miss it. It's okay to not get where you're going on the first step. But this year is a year of progress. And before we go into February, before we get caught up in all the things of school and life and everything else, let me remind you, God is giving you this land. He's giving you some territory. He's giving you a calling. He's giving you something to do. Do it. Don't expect it to just fall into place. Yes, God will open doors that need to be opened, and he'll shut doors that need to be shut. And I'm not telling you to go against the voice of the Lord. If you feel like the Holy Spirit has specifically told you to sit still, then that's what you need to do. But for those of us that for the last year have been so stuck in the in-between, between the house of God and ruin, and we're just terrified to make any moves, this is the wake-up call. Make some progress. Take some steps because God has given you the land. It's time to take it. It's time to take it. Will you stand with me? This year, we're going to take some land, and we're going to do that by fighting together and not against each other. You've heard me say it for months now with all the division going on around us. One way or another, some things are going to settle. And I'm more interested in whether or not you can minister to anybody when it settles than I am whether or not you stood up for what you believe was right. Because, hear me clearly, there are so many things that need to be dealt with, that need to be mentioned, that need to be said. But someone's eternal security is always, always the most important thing What you're standing up for, what you believe is right, may very well be right, but it will not bring salvation. And we have got to make sure that we walk together as a full body of Christ in a way that gives people an opportunity to experience the love of Jesus Christ. Because what we're looking for here is reconciliation. We're looking for healing. We're looking for salvation, and that only comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So one more thing before I send you out of here. In our leadership team, our serve team for Oasis, almost every time we get together, but especially at the beginning of each semester, I write the words, keep, stop, start on a whiteboard. And we sit and talk through the things that this semester we want to keep. What worked well, right? What was good? What do we want to keep doing? What new things do we want to start? What can we do different this semester to reach more people, to love people better? And maybe most importantly, what can we stop? What's been a waste of time? What didn't work? What, let's take an evaluation moment and process what to keep, what to stop, and what to start. That's your action point. That's your quote unquote homework for tonight. And your own heart between you and Jesus. I believe this is a year of progress for us as a ministry, for us as a church, for us as a city, but specifically for you as an individual. So in 2021, maybe even this week, what things should you keep? What things should you stop and start? Eyes closed and heads bowed throughout the room. 
if you're here tonight and you'd say, uh, Pastor, I hear you, and it kind of sounds like a self-help, <laughs> but before any of that's going to make any sense, um, I need to know Jesus. If you're here tonight and you would say, I don't know that I know Jesus at the level that I need to for any of this to make any sense, if you would just even say, I've, I've stepped away, and what God wants me to do is to stop running and to start turning to Him, if that's you with nobody looking around, will you just throw your hand up for me? Thank you, Lord. If you're here tonight and you'd say, you know what, Caleb, yeah, it's time to make some moves. I've been processing some things. I've been praying about some things for a minute, but I do believe God has something in store. Maybe you know exactly what it is. Maybe you're unsure what it looks like, but you are completely sure you're done being where you are. If you believe God has called you to make progress in 2021, will you throw your hand up for me? Amen. 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 This may sound silly, but here's, here's what I want you to do with, with eyes closed. I just want you to kind of hold your hands out, palms up, like uh, you're ready to, you're ready to be handed something, but you're also ready for something to be taken out of your hands. Lord, it, it may seem like a silly little gesture, but our prayer tonight is that you would take out whatever you need to take out, and it may not feel good. But God, take out whatever you need to take out because this year is too important. The calling that you've put on our lives is too important and the progress in the kingdom that needs to be made is way too important for us to just keep playing around. So God, whatever needs to be taken out, take it out and help us to not pick it back up. And then equally, God, fill us back up. That spot, that place, put more anointing in it, put more of your Holy Spirit in it, that the full fruit of the Spirit, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, God, that these things would just be in more and more abundance in our lives as the Holy Spirit fills us afresh and anew. God, we give you the junk that shouldn't be there, and we ask that you would fill it with dreams and visions, with joy, with passion, and with some clarity on what that next step looks like. God, thank you that this year we're going to make progress. Thank you that this year we're going to make progress. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. And we pray all these things in your name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much. for.